They are the handiest of all blokes, the toughest of geezers, the most absolute of units. They are the British Army's Special Air Service, or SAS, and you don't need us to introduce them to you, you know exactly who they are already. They are the world's single most famous military unit, and today we shall be providing you with a comprehensive overview of their origins, their evolution, and their modern day antics. So let's not faff about, let's just jump into it, shall we? The SAS was created during World War II by Lieutenant David Sterling, who had been serving with No. 8 Commando in North Africa and found their methods lacking. In particular, he disliked the fact that they always deployed in large groups, which often left them vulnerable to detection by the enemy. A vulnerability which on a good day left him and his men frantically scrambling back to base with their tails between their legs, and on a bad day could see entire sections of men wiped out without having made so much as a dent in their objective. To counter this, he suggested a whole new type of special operations unit, one made up of small groups of hyper well-trained and conditioned men who would parachute behind enemy lines, stay hidden, and enact all kinds of mischief onto high-value targets such as supply lines, aircraft, and senior leadership. This innovative idea, aimed at maximizing impact with minimal forces, was initially met with skepticism by many. But one important man found it most tantalizing. General Claude Auchinleck, the commander-in-chief of the Middle East, who gave Sterling the go-ahead to start poaching whatever men and material he needed to make his idea a reality in July 1941. The first iteration of the unit, named L Detachment Special Air Service Brigade, was a modest thing, comprising of only five officers and 60 enlisted men, but these were the best of the best. Sterling had personally inspected every commando unit, then deployed to North Africa, and lured the cream of the crop away with promises of glory and a cheeky little pay rise to boot. Eager not to rest on his laurels, however, Sterling then proceeded to train these men hard, putting them through all manner of grueling physical torture at Kabrit Camp in Egypt, adamant that his small unit idea would be vindicated when the time came. And that time would mean November of that year, when his unit was given its first mission, Operation Squatter. The plan was a simple one. The lads would drop at Ghazala and Tamimi, double time it to nearby airfields, destroy every airplane that they could get their hands on, and then get out of there when the German response started to get serious. Unfortunately for Sterling, the operation was an absolute disaster. High winds blew both the deploying aircraft and the men who jumped out of them far from one another, and to make matters worse, the ground was waterlogged and untraversable. Not one man reached his objective, and the defending Germans had an easy time picking them off, with only 22 out of 62 men returning from the operation. Sterling wasn't deterred by this setback, however, and with continued support from Auchinleck, he integrated his surviving unit with the long-range desert group and ditched aerial infiltration in favor of ground infiltration via truck and jeep. As a result of this, their next operation was every bit the success as their last one was a failure, with them destroying a total of 61 aircraft after an arduous three-day expedition through the harsh Libyan desert. From here, things only got better and better for the SAS, as with their founding philosophy now thoroughly vindicated, they were let loose across North Africa to cause havoc however they saw fit in 1942. They were also expanded into two full regiments, one and two SAS. Notable operations included a raid on Burrat Port in January, in which they caused severe damage to the harbour, petrol tanks and storage facilities, and ground axis shipping to a halt for a time, and a September raid which saw them inflict catastrophic damage to a port at Benghazi and destroy 15 aircraft at Alberka Airfield. All in all, SAS operations in North Africa would prove so successful that the time the theatre was won in May 1943, they alone had destroyed more than 300 aircraft. Sterling himself was captured a little before this, in January 1943, and spent the rest of the war as a prisoner, and so command of the SAS fell to Major Paddy Main, one of the most decorated British soldiers of the entire war. Under his direction, the SAS continued to flourish and participated in operations such as Operation Narcissus, a raid on a lighthouse in Sicily, and Operation Chester not a deep raid aimed at disrupting enemy communications, also in Sicily. They also took part in significant operations in France, like Operation Houndsworth and Operation Ball Basket, both of which aimed to disrupt German communications and logistics. By the end of the war, then, the SAS's detractors had long since fell silent. Their utility had been proven unequivocally, and only one question then remained. Were they still needed? A question to which the answer seemed to be no. To us, blessed as we are, with hindsight, it sounds preposterous to hear that the SAS was disbanded, but with Clement Attlee's obsession with cutting the defense budget to shreds, 
That's exactly what ended up happening. Most of the service was immediately demobbed following the end of hostilities, and on the 8th of October 1945, it was axed altogether, the few remaining members being transferred to other units. But eager though he was to strip the UK's defense capabilities bare, Attlee was eventually forced to recognize what a monumental mistake it was to disband the SAS when the Greek Civil War broke out in 1946, as he suddenly found himself with a need for a group of heavily trained, handy lads who could conduct covert operations in small groups. In response to this, the few remaining SAS veterans still on the books were lumped together into an ad hoc unit under the command of the Secret Intelligence Service, or MI6. They were deployed immediately to Greece, where they undertook intelligence gathering and anti-partisan duties and also hunted down the odd Nazi war criminal. Atlee's administration, with his hands now being held by the military lest to make any more blunders, then started to think about how the SAS should actually work in the Cold War world. This led to the formation of three separate regiments under the SAS's cap badge. The first was 21 SAS, who were formed out of the Artist Rifles Light Infantry Regiment in July 1947. Curiously, this was only a reserve regiment, meaning that its members were not full-time soldiers and instead committed themselves as on a part-time basis only, only being called up as full-time when and where they were needed. Next came 22 SAS, the main regiment, which was formed in 1952. This was a regular, full-time unit made using members of the 21 SAS who could be persuaded to fully commit, as well as veterans of 1 and 2 SAS who could be lured back to the military. Notably, at this time, this was the only regular regiment of the British Army to have been formed from a reserve unit. Finally, there was 23 SAS. Formed in 1959 out of the Reserve Reconnaissance Unit, it was another part-time unit like 21 SAS. And if you happen to think that 21 and 23 SAS were in any way weaker for being reserve regiments, well, think again, as Sterling himself had this to say on the matter. I would like to emphasize the importance of the two SAS territorial regiments. At the start of the Second World War, it was the ideas and initiatives of these amateur soldiers which led to the creation of at least two units within the Special Forces and gave a particular alarm to others. When, however, a specialist unit becomes part of the military establishment, it runs the risk of being conventionalized. Luckily, the modern SAS looks safe from this danger. It is constantly experimenting with innovative techniques, many of which stem from its territorial regiments, drawn as they are from every walk of civilian life. The reformed SAS was deployed extensively throughout the Cold War and ended up initially specializing in counter-revolutionary warfare. The Malayan Emergency saw them becoming masters of the jungle, working closely with local populations to conduct covert operations against the Malayan National Liberation Army. They also honed their skills in the Middle East, assisting the Sultan of Oman against rebel tribesmen and the British Aden campaign in Yemen, both in the 1960s. The SAS also played a significant and controversial role in the Troubles. First deploying in 1973, their involvement mostly took the form of small teams of individuals advising conventional units, with occasional specialist operations as and when the situation called for it, with one such operation being the arrest of Peter Cleary, a leading member of the provisional IRA's South Armagh Brigade. Implicated in the killing of Ulster Defence Regiment Corporal Robert McConnell, Cleary was on the run in Ireland and had secretly returned to Northern Ireland on the 15th of April 1976. He arrived at his girlfriend's house, which had been under SAS surveillance, and was immediately leapt upon and arrested. Clear is then taken to a field to await a military helicopter, during which time an SAS officer, left to guard him, shot him twice, after Cleary supposedly attempted to seize his rifle and escape. Surviving these shots, an NCO then delivered a final fatal shot to Cleary as he lay on the floor. A hearing was held on the matter nine months later, but testimonies conflicted, and therefore the truth of the matter remains unclear to this day. Throughout the Cold War, the SAS also found itself being deployed ever more to counter terror operations, both domestically and abroad. This is exemplified by their role in the Iranian embassy siege. This was a mass hostage situation that began on the 30th of April 1980, when six armed men stormed the Iranian embassy in London and took 26 hostages. The situation escalated over the following six days, culminating in the gunman killing a hostage and throwing his body out of a window. This was the final straw, and the SAS were called in to bring the situation to an end in what was dubbed Operation Nimrod. Two teams, Red Team and Blue Team, were involved. Red Team abseiled from the roof, while Blue Team lowered a stun grenade through a skylight that was meant to detonate at the very moment Red Team penetrated the building. However, one abseiler became entangled, complicating entry as explosives could no longer be used to quickly penetrate the building. Instead, a Red Team had to fall back on sledgehammers to smash their way inside. It could the prove to be little detriment, though. In the space of 17 minutes, Red Team eliminated five out of the six gunmen, took the final one prisoner, and evacuated all of the hostages bar one, who was killed by the gunmen when they realized they were under attack. The SAS were also pivotal during the 1982 Falklands War. 
They first saw action in Operation Paracat, the successful attempt to retake South Georgia on the 25th of April, when they battled not just the Argentinians, but also the horrific weather conditions, including freezing sleet and 100 mile per hour winds. They successfully retook the island in a single day without suffering a single casualty. When the campaign on the Falkland Islands themselves began, the SAS left the conventional fighting to the rest of the military and instead focused on special operations, with a notable exploit being their raid on Pebble Island. Occurring on the night of the 14th of May, it saw 45 SAS troopers land on the titular islands, which had been converted into a forward operating base for Argentine aircraft. The raid was a complete success, and the SAS successfully destroyed 11 Argentine aircraft, a fuel and ammunition dump, and got out before daybreak, rendering the island strategically useless for the rest of the war. Some SAS troops even made it into Argentina itself, although their operation was cancelled when the Argentine army dispatched 2,000 soldiers to rout out infiltrators. Since the end of the Cold War, very little has changed for the SAS. It still comprises the three same regiments and still sticks to the same dual focus of counter-terror and special operations as it did before the war came down, with a major deployment being to Iraq for the first Gulf War. There, once the air campaign began, the SAS moved from Saudi Arabia into southern Iraq with broad authority to attack and harass Iraqi forces at their own discretion, with a particular focus of destroying Scud missile launches should the opportunity present itself. Operating in heavily armed Land Rover columns, they traveled by night, hid by day, and employed motorcycle outriders for scouting as they prowled the Iraqi expanses, making a nuisance of themselves. They also had some more specific missions during the conflict, with one of the most famous being Bravo 20, led by Sergeant Andy McNabb. This patrol, tasked with finding and destroying specific SCUD installations, faced numerous challenges, including compromised positions, intense battles with Iraqi forces, issues with radio frequencies, and a harrowing escape and evasion journey across the desert to Syria. It ended in disaster following the capture and imprisonment of several team members, though one, Chris Ryan, managed an incredible solo escape to Syria. The SAS then found itself back at the Levant following the rise of ISIS, conducting various operations targeting the group, particularly in northern Iraq. There, they focused on attacking ISIS leadership and collaborated closely with Kurdish resistance fighters and proved instrumental in the fight against the group. Across the border in Syria, they were deployed to support UK airstrikes, with small units being deployed covertly to get up close and personal with the enemy and use laser designators to allow the RAF to destroy ISIS targets with precise munitions that would minimize collateral damage. Like in Iraq, they also cooperated with local factions, with their notable operation being one conducted just outside of the Syrian border town of Qabane, where British and American forces joined together to drive out jihadists slaughtering Kurdish civilians. All in all, it is very likely that without the intervention of the SAS, ISIS would not have fallen quite so quickly or dramatically if it would have done at all. As an expansion of their traditional counter-terrorist duties, the SAS also regularly finds itself posted to major public events, both to provide immediate security coverage and as a rapid response force in case anything untoward should happen. Think of any major national event from recent memory, and SAS troopers would have been on the rooftops keeping an eye on things. The 2012 Olympics, King Charles III's coronation, and Prince William and Kay Middleton's wedding. Every one of them was supervised by the ever-vigilant eye of the SAS, ready and able, should any terror attacks unfold to disrupt proceedings. Fortunately, nothing in recent history has occurred that would warrant their intervention, and modern London, Touchwood, has thus far been spared a repeat of the Iranian embassy siege. Finally, leaked documents also suggest that the SAS has been posted to more recent conflicts the UK is not officially involved in. But as discussing leaked materials can be pretty dubious with the powers that be here on this illustrious platform, we shan't be discussing them. But it is totally something you can absolutely Google for yourself after you watch this video. But just why are the SAS so unfathomably famous? After all, while they are certainly up there in their abilities and could well be the best special forces unit on the planet, period, it's not as if they don't have some very stiff competition for that title. There's the KSK, Germany's equivalent outfit, South Korea's special forces brigades, and China's offering the Northeastern Tiger. These are all units that most commentators agree can match the SAS's capabilities, if not surpass them in some areas, so why do these remain so elusive in the cultural zeitgeist, yet the SAS have fame sufficient to make them a household name? And that'd be four words. The Iranian Embassy Siege. Prior to the siege, the SAS were just as anonymous and unknown as all of the other aforementioned Special Forces unit, their name typically being known only to servicemen, veterans, and civilians for an enthusiasm for all things military. 
But the siege, being conducted so publicly in front of the world's television cameras and in such a dramatic style, with hordes of black shrouded men rappelling down the side of a grand building before delivering 9mm retribution straight into the center mass of a group of terrorists, well that changed all of that in a really big way. Then, suddenly, the world was hungry to know everything there was to know about this elusive group of hyper-elite warriors, and the media was more than happy to feed that perishing hunger. Suddenly, SAS operations, formerly the staff of the back pages, were frontline news, and coverage of any conflict the UK found itself in would feature some coverage of the SAS's antics therein, and each crazy story only drove the public's desire to know more about them further in an unending cycle. Then. There was the role of fictional media, which played up the SAS's ever more mythical status to hawk more copies of whatever story it was pushing that week, be it in the form of a book such as Rainbow Six, a video game such as Call of Duty, or a film such as Bravo 2 Zero. The inclusion of the SAS became an advertising gimmick to let audiences know they were in for an adrenaline-pumping, high-octane adventure, which in turn only further fueled the mythical status of the SAS in the audience's mind, the mythical status that, in light of a continuing barrage of wild stories and fantastical fictional depictions, doesn't look like it's going anywhere anytime soon.